Welcome everyone. Anybody here for the first time tonight in the room? Welcome to all of you, welcome. Anybody joining for the first time at home on Zoom, welcome to you as well. You can see um, the room in the ATS Zoom and we can all see the people on Zoom on the TV. Um, I'm like fighting off a cold, so don't give me a hug or anything tonight. Uh, my son has a cold, my girlfriend has a cold. I can feel it kind of in my throat. Hopefully I won't get anybody sick. I'll keep my distance from everybody. Um, so I'll do my best tonight. One of the dangers of the way that I teach is that I uh, don't prepare and I just rely on my mind, which um, works pretty good if my mind is clear. And then once in a while, if I'm not feeling well and my mind is not clear, then sometimes it's even better actually, because I just, the ego gets out of the way <laughs> a little bit, but sometimes it's not as, as clear, I think. Um, our topic for tonight, we've just completed a whole six month series on the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. And We've come to the eighth factor, the eighth thing that the Buddha talked about as being a necessary skill on this path to awakening, and that's concentration. And so the last few weeks, we've talked about the difference between uh, mindfulness, open awareness, um, and concentrated, directed awareness. And um, last week, we did loving kindness, and we can do what are called the heart practices, loving kindness and compassion forgiveness, equanimity, appreciation, these positive emotions, these wise responses, we can do them um, as concentration practices. When we recite these phrases over and over in our mind, we're concentrating our awareness. We're choosing to focus our attention in that way on uh, the given topic, loving kindness or compassion. So tonight we're on compassion and uh, we'll do a compassion meditation. But I'd like to start class by um, trying to facilitate people connecting and then having some community. It's one of the refuges, it's one of the core tenets of Buddhism to develop community and to connect and make relationships with people who are interested in what you're interested in, healing a lot of our communities in recovery, awakening, getting free from suffering. Um, and it's hard to do in a silent meditation group <laughs> to, to meet each other. So I always like to have you introduce yourselves. Um, if you're sick like myself, keep your distance, put on your mask, uh, that kind of thing. And the topic tonight is compassion. So my question, like introduce yourself, you'll get into small groups at home. I put you into these Zoom breakout rooms, um, which is breakout rooms. Um, so the topic is compassion and reflecting for a moment, uh, what's compassion feel like when you're feeling compassionate? What's it feel like to you? Where do you feel compassion? Is it a thought in your mind? Is it a sensation in your body, in your chest, in your heart? Uh, where do you feel com when you're, when you're empathizing and feeling connected and caring, um, and as you reflect on this and discuss it a little bit with each other, what's the difference in the feeling between having compassion for someone else, someone that you care about that's suffering and having compassion for them? Or maybe somebody you don't even know that's suffering and having compassion for them. And what's the difference between that and the feeling of having compassion for yourself when you're experiencing pain, when you're experiencing something really difficult and meeting your own pain, your own difficulty with, compassion? What's that feel like? Uh, maybe some of you will be like, I have no fucking idea. That's why I'm here. You're supposed to teach us that shit. Uh, and that, so that's a, that's a valid answer. <laughs> that's a totally valid answer. Uh, but most of you have been at it for long enough and trying to develop compassion that I'm sure you have some experience moments where it's like, I'm being very friendly towards this pain. And it feels like this rather than meeting it with hatred, meeting it with mercy with friendliness, with some level of uh, care, tenderness, warmth, whatever word resonates as how it feels to you. 
So uh, find some people that you don't know yet and discuss compassion and try to keep it in your direct experience. Welcome back. A few things about compassion and what um, I believe we're trying to experience um, and how completely counter to our survival instinct it is to have compassion for our own pain. One of the reasons why happiness and freedom from suffering is so difficult is because in order to truly have a sustainable sense of well-being and ease and happiness, uh, that has to include all of the times when unpleasant experience is happening. And there's so much unpleasant experience when you have a body with a nervous system that experiences pain and emotional, difficult emotions and and all of the unpleasant thoughts that our mind experiences produces. My sense is that the Buddha spent a long time seeing if it was possible to just get rid of the unpleasantness. Could we meditate? And, and that's, a, I think, a common misconception. Could we meditate away all of the unpleasantness of existence? If I'm spiritual enough, if I'm good enough, if I'm wise enough, can I get rid of all the pain of existence? And um, as it turns out, the answer is no. <laughs> Unfortunately, the answer is no. No matter how fucking good, how spiritual, how mindful, how wise, enlightened, fully enlightened. This is important to remember. The fully enlightened Buddha continues to experience all of the unpleasant experiences of having a body all of the unpleasant experiences of having uh, a nervous system uh, and emotions, all of the un unpleasant emotions don't even completely cease. And certainly the mind doesn't all of a sudden become only wise. The conditioned habits of the unwise mind seem to continue even after enlightenment. This is what the Buddha reported anyways. I wouldn't know, <laughs> not there yet, but um, it makes more sense that the reason we have to develop compassion is because we're gonna have to continue to contend with unpleasantness. As long as we're alive, as long as you have you know, incarnated and continue to exist in a physical form, then you're gonna have pain. It's unavoidable, it's non-negotiable, it's reality. And we have a, a survival instinct that hates pain. We, we, we experience it consciously or unconsciously, automatically as a threat to our existence, and we meet it with aversion. I hate this. I want to get rid of it. I want to avoid it, suppress it, medicate it, get distracted from it. I don't want to feel the unpleasantness. And if you reflect on your own life, how much of your suffering so far has come from uh, hating what's happening? Some unpleasant shit has happened in your life, right? Maybe even today, some unpleasant you know, and, and when I say unpleasant, I mean all the way from like atrocious, traumatic wounds to just like traffic, <laughs> to just like smells and tastes and sights and sounds that are unpleasant. Everywhere from just the very minor annoyances to the really big heartbreaks and tragedies and griefs and pains of, of life, 
you know, so it's all on the scale. And some of us have probably experienced much more uh, sustained, painful, abusive, you know, experiences than others. Uh, maybe some of you haven't had a lot of huge pains in your life, but you're still constantly annoyed by all of the unpleasantness of just having a mind that is judgmental and has a tendency to compare and uh, feel self-centered, uh, you know, less than or maybe more than or whatever your mind's tendency is. It's unpleasant existence often. I wonder how often, and you know, I wonder how often if you really had a, try, I'm always so curious, I'm not big on technology, but I always keep kind of coming back to this. Like if we had some sort of, you know, the Apple, I, I wear an Apple watch once in a while and it has that little like, you should be mindful right now with these reminders. Right now is a good time for mindfulness and it's programmed into it. I'm like, oh, fuck yeah, it is. It's a good time for, it's a good time for mindfulness. But if there was some way to track like what your perception of your experience was, how many unpleasant experiences your nervous system is, your mind is experiencing every day. Like think about today, how many unpleasant sensations, you feel any discomfort? Like even right now, like if you haven't yet, you're about to. Sitting still for an hour is gonna hurt. It's designed. <laughs> to hurt, right? Your ass is going to start hurting. You're going to start getting, you know, like uh, restless from stasis. But maybe you had some other difficult, maybe your mind created some pain for you or you had some challenging experiences or conflicts. Maybe you hurt yourself physically in some way today or recently or having a little, you know, cold, little sickness coming on for me. I'm like, yeah, it's unpleasant. My throat feels a little tight and little sniffles and a little unpleasant. I'm tired. So all of that is to say that because that's the reality of our life and our existence and being human, um, we need compassion. As it turns out, Compassion is the only antidote when it comes to suffering about unpleasant experiences. It's the only wise response. Because there's pain, you know, and, and Buddhism says we can end suffering. In this lifetime, this beautiful promise, in this lifetime, through your own efforts, you can end all of the suffering in your life. Think about that for a moment. In this lifetime, through your own efforts, your own meditative discipline, renunciation, study, practice, you can learn to not suffer about what's happening in your life. There's nowhere that Buddhism says, if you meditate enough, you can end pain and difficulty and conflict and you can change the world and everybody will behave. If you're enlightened, then everyone will be kind. Never, says none of that bullshit promises. Just the reality that it's possible to become non-reactive to our pain. And rather than the habitual reactive tendency that all living beings have, which is aversion to pain, it's possible to learn to meet pain with compassion. But it's not possible of like, that sounds so smart. I'm going to do that. It's not a decision we can make. I know for myself, um, 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, I heard this shit and I was like, makes sense. And I can see how I've been creating all of this extra suffering in my already painful life by hating it. I'm going to start being compassionate from now on. <laughs> and totally not being able to be is not, I couldn't, you know, it's not just a decision. It makes, you know, like we talk about it, you read the Buddhist books, you hear the Dharma and you're like that fucking 
makes sense. I want to do that. I want to not suffer about pain. I want to meet it with friendliness and care and mercy and compassion. I want that. But my mind doesn't do it very well, very naturally, very, and it's, you know, I can see in my first 10 years of meditation where I got a little bit better at compassion. And then in the second 10 years, a bit better. And then in the third, you know, three decades or so into it, I'm like, actually, I have the ability a lot of the time to meet the unpleasant experiences in my life with compassion. Not 100% of the time, but most of the time now. After decades of training my mind to go to this totally counter instinctual relationship to pain. So it happens, but it happens so gradually, so slowly over the years. And unfortunately, most people give up. Most people stop trying, stop meditating, stop training the mind, get disillusioned, get overwhelmed, get something. So compassion is a practice and it's a long-term practice. And it takes a steadfast, long-term commitment to truly become compassionate. And I'm talking about my own experience, but I love to um, talk about the Dalai, like His Holiness Tenzin Gyatso, the 14th Dalai Lama. You know that dude? And you th- I, like, when I, sometimes when I think of compassion, I think of the Dalai Lama of Tibet. And yet, you know, I just think like, wow, that guy's... He seems so compassionate. It's like what he teaches and he's, you know, it's his, it's his core. He seems so compassionate. But um, sometimes he'll talk about how uh, his process of becoming compassionate was decades. He said, when I was a kid, I wasn't very compassionate. And he said, then I saw in my teen years doing, you know, raised as a monk and raised as a, I started to become a little bit more compassionate. And then in my 20s and my 30s, and he was saying this he's in his 70s, I think he's in his 80s now. It's like a 10 year old talk I was listening to. Um, he said, every decade I can see how actually I'm able to embody compassion a little bit more through continual daily training of my heart and inclining it towards compassion. I keep making progress towards being a more and more compassionate person. I hope that's uh, somewhat helpful to know that it's not a quick fix, to know that compassion um, won't get rid of the pain or difficulties in your life. It'll help you be non-reactive to them and to be responsive, to respond with the appropriate relationship, the wise relationship to pain and um, are you, I'll use the term in the meditation instructions, mercy. And you can think about that for a moment. What's mercy mean to you? To be merciful. What would it mean to be merciful towards yourself? Or to be merciful towards someone else. Thinking about mercy and or thinking about tolerance. What's it mean to, to be um, tolerant? What's the difference between tolerance and mercy and compassion? Because I feel like there's a um, they're connected and that there's a process, my own experience when I started to try to develop compassion and experience compassion, it's like, I can't fucking do it, but I can just sit here and tolerate discomfort without running from it. I can learn to be uncomfortable without getting high to avoid it. I can stay sober. That feels like an act of tolerating difficult mind states. feels also like an act of mercy. The definition of mercy is something like not causing harm in a situation where you have the power to cause harm. Refraining from making it worse. When we meet our pain with aversion, we make it worse and we turn pain into suffering. When we meet our pain with 
tolerance, you might not quite be. Compassion feels like almost like it's like a loving relationship, a friendly, a caring, a, a warm relationship. Tolerance feels like I don't really care about you, but I'm not going to kick your ass. <laughs> I'm just going to tolerate you. You're really fucking annoying and I don't really love you. But I'm going to tolerate you, right? So developing that kind of relationship. First, I'm just going to tolerate without making it worse. And then mercy feels similar in that, like, the more we hear the Dharma, the more we wake up, the more we see. I actually have a lot of influence over uh, how I re respond to what I experience. It happens somewhat automatically, aversion to pain, without mindfulness, it's just the reactive tendency. But as we become more mindful, we start to see, I actually have some agency. I have a tendency to meet it with aversion, but if I try to meet it with acceptance and tolerance, friendliness, then it's at this act of, of mercy, not making it worse. Does this make sense? Like in every moment, according to the Dharma, you have the ability to make whatever you're experiencing worse. You can kick your own ass all day by hating what you're experiencing by hating the world, by hating yourself, by hating others, you can make your life fucking miserable. And most of us have done a lot of that in our lives. But it's an act of mercy to say, you know what? This is already unpleasant enough and people are unpleasant enough and the world is, I'm gonna stop making it worse. I have this power to make it worse or actually I have the power to Accept it. Eventually, you'll really have that power. Eventually, you'll really have that influence. Eventually, you'll really have that choice. In the beginning, when you first start meditating, maybe not yet, it's okay. But if you keep going long term, sitting, going to the retreats, getting on your cushion, coming to Sangha, following this path, you'll see I have more and more agency over how I respond to my own mind, to my sensations, my emotions, to the people around me, more and more ability to respond mercifully. And again, I feel like mercy still isn't quite loving. It's still sort of that, I'm just not gonna make it worse. <laughs> I'm just not gonna cause extra harm here where I have the power to. Compassion feels like this other piece where there's a, a soothing feeling, like we're tending to it, not just with tolerance, but with care, with warmth, with maybe love for a lack of a better word, a loving relationship. Not I love pain, <laughs> but I'm meeting my pain with love instead of hatred, with friendliness instead of resentment and anger and aversion. All right, got the Dharma talk out of the way. Find a way to sit that's upright, relaxed. I'll chug some green juice and here we go. Releasing any tension that you can release, softening the jaw, the shoulders, the belly.
reflecting on these teachings on compassion, your own desire to be compassionate, to end suffering in your life around pain. As we sit still in meditation, having already been about 30 minutes into the class, any discomfort that the body experiences becomes an opportunity, a direct opportunity for tolerating that discomfort, for meeting it with mercy, the intention of compassion. Begin saying to yourself, may I learn to care about suffering and confusion and pain in my own life? May I learn to respond with mercy and compassion, both internally and externally. May I uncover the compassionate heart. May I be filled with compassion in my responses to the difficulties, the pains, the unpleasantness that I encounter. May I learn to respond to the pain, confusion, suffering with mercy and compassion. May I learn to care. Inclining the heart, training the mind towards a compassionate response. So you can find a couple of sentences, a couple of phrases. May I learn to be compassionate, keep it simple. May I learn to respond with mercy, friendliness, care to my pain. And then reciting these compassionate phrases to yourself over and over, whether you mean it yet or not, or just training the mind, concentrating the awareness on these compassionate intentions. May I learn to care about suffering and confusion. May I respond to pain with mercy and empathy. May I be filled with compassion.
I'm beginning to expand from this narrow focus on our own relationship to pain, to our own pain, and expanding to our relationship to other people's pain. Start with someone that's really easy to care about, what's traditionally called the benefactor, someone who's inspired you, supported you, that you've benefited from knowing or knowing about. Could be just somebody whose teachings you've appreciated, books you've read. Again, sending compassion from your heart to theirs. May you be filled with compassion. May you meet the difficulties in your life with mercy and compassion. knowing that no matter how wise they are, they still experience pain. Sending compassion, caring towards their pain. Without any attachment to it being different, without any codependent suffering about what other people experience, Just compassion, caring, without clinging. That's the intention anyways, the goal. Ending it from the benefactor, bring it to the Sangha, the people that you had a small group with tonight, in your Zoom rooms or in the room here that you're sitting next to. Incline your heart towards compassion for their pain, just like you, they experience the difficult thoughts and emotions, the pain of their past. Living with this aversive tendency that we all have. May you be met with compassion. And extending our caring intentions towards their pain.
expanding further to begin reflecting on some of the people that are difficult. Some of the people that you have some resentment towards or judgment towards. Some of the people maybe that have harmed you in some ways. And use your mind to reflect on what kind of pain, what kind of suffering and confusion must these people experience in order to be so unskillful, unfriendly, unkind? Opening to the possibility of even an inkling of empathy for the ignorance and confusion of your enemies. Allow yourself to see their suffering. Even if it's not obvious, look deeper. See their pain. And to whatever extent you can, try to meet their pain with some compassion, with mercy, with the intention of friendliness. And maybe it's just aspirational at this point and you can Say to yourself, may I learn to care about the pain and confusion of my enemies, the difficult people that I resent, that I judge, that I fear. May I learn to respond with mercy and compassion towards the pain of even the most confused people on this planet. Begin to extend the intention of compassion, the wish for all beings to be met with mercy. With friendliness, the wish for all beings to be free from suffering. Extending this to the east and west and north and south. As we open the heart and mind to all of the pain in this world, the ignorance, rather than hating it. I'm gonna meet it with compassion. May I learn to meet all living beings with compassion, those far and near, young and old, the wise and the unwise, those experiencing oppression, as well as the oppressors,
all directions, all living beings, training our minds, our hearts, to be tolerant and merciful and compassionate. For the last few minutes, just bring it back into your own body right now. The sensations that you're feeling, any unpleasant sensations that you're feeling, try softening into, soften your belly, your shoulders. Relax into the pain as an act of mercy, tolerance. sometimes find it a bit um, difficult to explain. Sometimes somebody will say, well, like, okay, but how do I, how do I do it? <laughs> how do I have compassion? And I find it a bit difficult. And I think that like with so much of um, the Dharma, the first thing is just to have that orientation, that intention. So the second factor of the Eightfold Path, to have this, I'm not going to be able to do it all the time, but I, at least I'm going to try. It's my intention to 
be compassionate. And for most of us would admit that when we come to practice, we come to the Dharma, we come to meditation, recovery, whatever brings you in, um, probably very few of us would say like, oh yeah, I was really trying to be compassionate. I was trying to avoid pain. I was trying to create pleasure but I wasn't trying to meet my pain with compassion. It's very foreign actually to, for most of us, I don't know if this feels true to you. I know for myself, I had, you know, like compassion wasn't on my radar. Avoidance was on my radar. <laughs> Suppression, ignoring, uh, but not caring towards my own pain. I wasn't and then you come here and you hear it and you start meditating and you start trying. And so that's, that's the beginning is like, you just keep reorienting of trying. Some of the things, of course, the meditation helps saying these phrases over and over. My own experience was I said the compassion phrases and didn't mean them at all. I would say it in almost a sarcastic inner voice. I'm like, may I be merciful? Yeah, right. And it took me some months and years to actually be able to be sincere internally with like, actually, I really want to be merciful. I actually really, it is my, it has become my intention. But that for me, that took some time. I want to be compassionate. I'm not, I don't know how yet, but I want to. Um, it's my intention. I'm going to keep trying. So the meditation, the mind training, the we are we are kind of brainwashing ourselves in some ways. We are we have this untrained mind and uh, that has neuro pathways of aversion. The human brain has a, a negativity bias and a, a tendency towards aversion, not a natural tendency towards compassion. So by saying the phrases over and over, you're we're creating neuro pathways of compassionate intention. So that's a huge part of how we get there. Part of our mindfulness, especially the first foundation uh, of mindfulness of the body, you know, becoming more present. And what am I even feeling? What is pleasant or unpleasant physically, emotionally, mentally? We, we start to wake up in the first foundation to what we're feeling sensation-wise. And the second foundation to is it pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, start identifying what we're feeling. Then we can say like, oh, okay, I see it. I see this, what the Buddha called dependent origination, this cycle of something unpleasant happens, aversion. <laughs> something pleasant happens, clinging. You start to just wake up to I'm doing that all day, every day. Craving, clinging, aversion. <laughs> Craving, clinging, aversion. It's just like this constant uh, cycle that's just going on all by itself inside of us. And, and as, as you know, my perspective is, uh, the good news is it's not your fault <laughs> that you are such a hater. You know, we like we use that term like, oh, you're a hater, you're negative, or you're aversive or judgmental or what it's like, Everybody is. It's just what the mind does. It hates. The untrained, unenlightened mind, body, heart hates pain. Universal truth, I think. The untrained heart, mind, body are not naturally compassionate. So mindfulness helps to wake us up to like, oh, what am I even feeling? And okay, now that I know what I'm feeling, I can try to respond more wisely. Now that I see this cycle of suffering that the mind body creates, I cannot take it so personally and not be like, I, it's me, it's my fault. It's just what the human mind body process does. And, so, and then, but there's an intervention. Compassion is an intervention. I want to start intentionally responding with more tolerance and mercy and compassion. Physically relaxing. You notice that when something painful is happening, you get tight. Where do you hold it? 
Is it your jaw? Is it your shoulders? Okay, I'm fine. Is it your belly? Uh, often a lot of us, like we clench the stomach, the heart core. Maybe your fist, maybe you notice, you know, holding your... So part of the journey to, towards compassion is also we're learning to soften. Soften your belly, release your jaw, release your fists, even body posture. How often are you like, you know, and just that sort of intention of just being open, just opening your chest a bit more, softening your belly. I said it in the meditation and I'll remind you. And I think that this is where Buddhist compassion is a bit different than what we're used to in the um, Western definition of compassion. I think I, I heard somewhere that the Western definition of compassion is something like to suffer with, right? Like if you really have compassion for me, you'll suffer with me. Right? That, that's empathy. Like, I'm fucking, I fucking love you. I'm going to suffer with you. I love you so much. I'm going to suffer for you. So fucking compassionate. I'm miserable. I hope you're happy about it. <laughs> Suffering for you, with you, at you. The Buddhist idea is to end suffering, and that compassion has no attachment in it. I have no attachment to your pain going away. I care about your pain, trying to. My intention is to meet your pain with friendliness, and, but I'm not going to suffer about you being in pain or you creating all kinds of suffering for yourself. Compassion is totally non-attached to people not being in pain. So if you suffer when people are in pain, as we do, right? Like, especially somebody you really care about and they're suffering a lot and you suffer with them. It's not true compassion and that's okay. Not as a judgment, but it's just not what our goal is. Our goal is I wanna to be totally present for your pain and care about it and not suffer about it and see that's your pain and I care about you and support you and encourage you and love the shit out of you, but I can't take your, compassion isn't uh, codependency, it's not. It understands our limitations. What we can do is care. Sometimes compassion becomes an action and there can be a compassionate action, which is like, oh, you're really suffering because you have a fucking, you know, splinter or whatever, and I can help you remove the splinter, you know, I can, there's sometimes action, compassionate, friendly, generous, loving actions. I don't want to say compassion so non-attached that we shouldn't try to help each other. We should absolutely try to be of service and support and encouragement. But ultimately we can't control anyone else. This is where the equanimity teachings come in, but it's part of compassion. Compassion is just caring. I talked last week about loving kindness being situational ethics. Sometimes the kindest thing to do is to have good boundaries and say no fucking way and get out. <laughs> Same thing with compassion. Sometimes the most compassionate thing to do is to stop enabling people's bad behavior. Sometimes that there can be, uh, and even the word passion. Sometimes there's a passionate, caring response. That's how I want to think about, you know, so, so on one hand, non-attached, on another level, passionate. We have this new art in the center um, that everybody here can see, the people at home. Let's see if I can show you the 
uh, doesn't really work that well. Anyways, those that wrathful face over there in your left corner is um, these are Mahakala. They are Tibetan Buddhist deities of compassion. And just check them out for a moment. They don't really look very compassionate, do they? They're going to fucking bite your head off. They look violent. They look like monsters. They look like fucking badass. You don't look at that and be like, whoa, that's really compassionate, dude. <laughs> that dude's super compassionate. Look at all those skulls around his head. Look at those fangs. But the Tibetan Buddhists focus so much of their Buddhism on compassion, and they have gentle, compassionate deities. They have like uh, White Tara and Avalokiteshwara. They have these deities that are not demon-like like these, that are compassionate deities. And then they have these, and they call them deities of fierce compassion because of situational ethics the ethical thing to do is sometimes be really gentle and loving and give a hug compassionate embrace and sometimes the most compassionate thing to do is to say get the fuck out not here or to you know they, these uh deities i'm i'm not really a scholar in tibetan buddhism but i'm familiar with it uh, mahakala vajrapani uh, it's like the, the Hindu goddess Kali, who's like holding the skulls and, you know, like dripping in blood. It's these Indian images that are like violent images, but the meaning is uh, to destroy ignorance. To have a compassionate, fierce commitment to destroying ignorance. And so the skulls are symbols of ignorance. The fangs are to bite through the aorta of ignorance, of self-centeredness, of hatred. And so it really shifts that, um, that sometimes there's a place for being passionately protective, passionately uh, you know, caring maybe self-defense, maybe defending others, maybe, you know, we're Buddhists, we're so into nonviolence and yes, nonviolence, but sometimes you need to protect each other or protect yourself if you're being attacked. And it's the compassionate thing to do to kick them in the nuts or the tits or whatever. <laughs> and I used that last week, but it's worth reusing. So uh, any questions about compassion, clarifications, comments? I don't know that I did a thorough teaching on compassion, but some of my thoughts about compassion, please. I'm just thinking like, uh, and you explained some of it, um, but like, if I experienced like, like, almost I could, like you asked about like, where do you feel it in your body? I couldn't really peg that, but like, it's like an, an arising, like an experience of maybe it's turning towards, I, I don't know, but like what um what are some of the characteristics that arise in you when you're experiencing compassion? Like a warmth, like a warm feeling towards. A, yeah. It's hard to put um, a sensation to friendliness, but part of it is, is that there's no tightness or um, defendedness, that there's like an openness and a, a softness or a warmth or a, a um, the word karuna that we're translating as compassion translates as something like um, being moved, 
quivering of your heart in response to pain, that there's a, a feeling moved. I don't always feel that. I don't feel like my heart is like quivering <laughs> in response, but there feels like an openness and a warmth. And, and I think that a lot of the times where I'm at, even 30 years in, is more around uh, mercy and kind of not non-aversiveness and openness to pain. And I don't feel like I'm always in this place of like loving warmth towards pain. You know, I think I have a ways to go. Um, but, some, but when I am in those moments of what feels like true compassion, it feels like an openness, a softness, a total acceptance of the situation without resistance to it. And then that's just caring and friendly. Doesn't need it to be other than it is. Yeah. Uh, Jeff or Emily, whoever had your hand up over there. Yeah, hey bro. Hey, I wondered if I could uh, get you to, to replay a response you had to a question I just thought was brilliant. The question was in regard to, uh, uh compassion burnout oh yeah you remember this and it had to do with the uh, compassion sort of like you you're doing it wrong and uh i think you went and said something about idiot compassion in that response too i just thought it was brilliant yeah um somebody recently asked me about um compassion fatigue when like for a psychotherapist or a nurse or a social worker or you know just even like a sponsor, you know, or like somebody who's just like doing a lot of service or, you know, in whatever ways. And, you know, there's this, you know, uh, concept that you can get burnt out if you're too compassionate or, you, you know, that there's, uh, they've termed it compassion fatigue, uh, which is probably makes perfect sense if your definition of compassion in your experience is suffering with your clients or your friends or your, if you're suffering with the world, it's gonna fatigue the shit out of you. Unsustainable, if that's what you're calling compassion. And, you know, Buddhism, we put so much emphasis on non-attachment. Don't cling, it doesn't need to be other than, accept it as it is, care about it, but, it's like this. And if it's painful, it's calling for friendliness. And if it's pleasant, it's calling for total, no but it's all calling for non-attachment. And so that if we're truly, you know, and on the process of, uh, I think we have to all have the humility that we're not gonna do it right. And we are gonna get fatigued because we are gonna cling as we're going towards non-clinging compassion you know, the, that process is going to be um, a process. And so it's one of the reasons why our own self-care meditation practice is so important. So that we have, I, I think in that, um, I don't remember if I said it in that or not, Jeff, but that uh, I was reflecting on that recovery saying of, uh, you can't give away what you don't have. And so um, if you don't have compassion for your own pain, this is where Buddhism is from the inside out. That if, you, if we don't have compassion, if you don't have tolerance and mercy for your own pain, and this is where we start, sit here and be uncomfortable, <laughs> learn to be more tolerant of your pain, then you'll be able to have tolerance for other people's pain in a better way, in a more understanding and wise way. They say that recovery saying goes on to say, you can't give away what you don't have, uh, but if you don't give away what you have, you can't keep it. The importance of service, the importance of empathy and compassion and that we're not, this Buddhism is not self-help. There is a huge part of it, which is altruistic service, engagement, creating a positive change in the world. The Buddha's enlightenment, you know, like we, he could have just said, I'm enlightened. I got here. Fuck the world. 
But he didn't. Out of compassion for all of the suffering in the world, he said, let me do what I can to teach people how to end their own suffering. And that's the most compassionate thing we can do is give people tools to end their own suffering. To support people to do their own work. The Buddha was quite clear. I can't take anybody's suffering away, but I can teach you how to take your own suffering away. I can't give you compassion, but out of compassion, I can teach you how to develop compassion for yourself and others. Anyways, some some thoughts about that. I hope that was part of what you were looking for, Jeff. Any other questions online or in the room or comments? No good, okay, let's end early. I'm serious. A <laughs> uh, couple of announcements. What are my announcements? I've got a day long on July 16th. Um, hear it against the stream. You can come online or you can uh, come in person. It's a series that I'm doing this year on deepening our commitments to the Buddhist path of renunciation, the five precepts of our commitment to living a life that is free from uh, violence or intentionally killing, living a life that is uh, free from dishonesty or stealing or lying, free from sexual misconduct, being wise and careful with our sexual energy, and free from intoxicants. These are the five ethical guidelines of the Buddha for us householders. So we'll take the precepts, we'll discuss where we've fallen short, you know, that these are ideals, and you know we can kind of come together and talk to each other about well i did a little bit of lying and i did a little bit of stealing and you know whatever it was um and then we recommit you know and so we're doing it every quarterly so the next one is july 16th taking refuge in the buddha the dharma the sangha the five precepts do some meditation some discussion everyone's welcome there is a charge to attend Uh, Anybody that can't afford the charge will be given a scholarship. It's open to everyone who wants to be here for those days. If you can afford it, give the money. It supports the center. If you can't afford it, just let me know. Uh, Send me an email or talk to me, and we'll put you on the registration for uh, a discounted rate or for free. If you really can't afford it, you're welcome to come. So, The next um, Against the Stream retreat is in October in um, Big Bear. It's open for registration now. It's a seven day, it's a week long silent meditation retreat and um, start planning your fall. I know it's just starting the summer. Let's start thinking about, can I get this week off in October to go and sit for a week and really deepen my non-attachment and my compassion through the retreat process. So consider signing up for that. I think it's the most affordable retreat. I'm really looking for affordable retreat opportunities. So many of the retreat centers are so expensive asking for $200 a night, which makes a seven day retreat 15 or $1,800. Um, This place we're able to do the retreat this year, seven days for $750. So just a little over a hundred bucks a night, which is the cheapest I've found in a long time. Um, So I hope a lot of you will be able to attend that. 750 is still a lot of money um, for some people. So I'll try to raise some scholarship money so people that can't afford the 750 will also be able to come. But I think that's it. I'll be back. I'm up to I'm up to this place where that retreat's gonna be for the weekend for the Refuge Recovery Conference um, this weekend, but I'll be back. I'll see you next Monday. Next Monday, we will open to um, appreciation, the the kind of counter to tonight. We talked all about the pain, compassion. Next week, we'll talk all about the pleasure and how not to fuck that up by meeting it with non-attached appreciation. So um, see you then. May any goodness that comes from our practice be gathered and offered outward in all directions, sharing the blessings with all living beings. May each one of us become more and more compassionate towards ourselves and each other. 
And together, may we create a positive change on this planet. See you soon, I hope.